you know, that over this last uh, 10 days, I've been reflecting. Over the last 10 days, um, he, he, you know, Ilona actually, let me back it up. Ilona's going to be speaking next Sunday on what she feels God is giving for us, which is new season. She's going to be speaking about a new season. And we are definitely in a new season, not just because we've opened the building, but because of all the new things that God is doing. Uh, if you've missed the vision gathering, then, then have a look at that when it comes out on an email and you'll hear some of the new stuff that's happening. But over the last 10 days, we've had our first wedding here. Last Sunday, we had our first baptism here. And this morning, we've had our first dedication here. So it's kind of like I've been a whole 10 days of new things happening here, all rites of passage. All around the whole concept of love, we've seen love of a couple coming together. We've seen the love of people giving their lives to Jesus and wanting to love and follow Him. And then the love of a parent for a child. And last Sunday, Simon said, uh, had this song going around his head, which he spoke on, What's Love Got To Do With It? Well, I've had another song going around my head. Uh, and, and if you remember the 80s, I want to know what love is. What a tune that was. This series could last forever if we do this whole love thing, all right? We'll go for another 25 or 100 years or something. But actually, what I, what's been going around my head is not I want to know what love is, but we want to know what love is. Because I think we do. I think we live in a love-starved world. We hear so much about love, but we're starved of real love. I think families and relationships, marriages, friendships, churches, communities, businesses, we are starved for real love. And there's another song that some of you who are older like me will remember. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. <laughs> it's the only thing that there's just too little of. Actually, what a load of rubbish. What the world doesn't need now is sweet love. What the world needs now is real love. Real love is not sweet love. And as we've been witnessing like the love of, of a married couple and the love of a parent and the love of people giving their lives to Jesus... I want to say the biggest challenge in all of our lives is to love like God loves us. But here's the thing. It's the one thing that marks us out amongst anything else is the way that we love. It's the supreme value in the kingdom of God. Francis Chan, who's, who's a, an author and a communicator, he said this. God's definition of what matters is pretty straightforward. He measures our lives by how we love. God will measure my life, not by my sermons, not by my leadership, not by traveling, not by buildings, not by any of that. He'll measure my life by how I love. He'll measure your life by how you love. He'll measure how we live as a community by how we love. And I think the world is love starved. Would you agree? I think we're starved of real love. So what I want to do this morning is I'm going to look at what real love looks like. We're going to go to the classroom first, and then we're going to go to the living room, okay? So we're going to go to the classroom, look at some theory, and then we're going to look at it in real life. So if you've got a Bible, come with me to 1 John chapter 4. Can I just say, if you're looking for books in the Bible to read, the book of 1 John is a great book. It's not John's gospel, it's the same author. This is one of his letters towards the end of the New Testament. There's five chapters so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, if you could, do, you could do one chapter a day this week and you would be, your heart would be full up because it's an incredible little book and it's not a long read at all. But this is in chapter 4 and from verse 7. It says this, Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. This is pretty direct stuff because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. And we've sung about it this morning. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, in other words, He loved us this way. Okay, we'll talk about it in a moment. We also ought to love one another. So there's a direct correlation between the way God loves us and the way we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. No one has ever seen God. But if we love, all of a sudden, maybe they do get to see God. Because God is love. Are you joining the dots? God is love. We can't see God. But God loves us. If we love God like He loves us, maybe people get to see God. So let's look at this in theory for a little moment or, or, or in the classroom. Real love has its origin in God. We are never more like God than when we love. Clement of Alexandria was one of the early church leaders. He said a real Christian practices being God. Sounds a really bold claim. But basically as we love like Him, 
We are never more like him than when we love. You see, real love has a double relationship to God. It's only by knowing God that we learn to love, and it's only by loving that we learn to know God. Many people say to me, we need to know more, we need to know more, we need more knowledge, we need to go deeper, we need to go deeper. And I get all of that, but listen, the deepest you can ever go is to love. It's not how much knowledge, the Bible says that knowledge puffs up, but love is, is the supreme value in the kingdom of God. It's not how much we know, it's how much we love. If only we could take what we know and put it into practice. If only we could take the knowledge and the love that we've had from God and put it into practice, wouldn't that be amazing? Real love is a revelation of who God is. The greatest single statement in the Bible is God is love. Not that God loves, but that God is love. And real love is ultimately demonstrated in Jesus Christ. Like it says, I just highlighted, we can't see God, but we see Him in Jesus. And Jesus said Himself, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is what God is like when you look at Jesus. And I think when you look at real love in Jesus, you see real love is sacrificial. Uh, and for me, real love is an explanation of creation. You know, the issue isn't how did God create the world. The big issue is why. You know, and we get caught up with how he did it. Did he do it in seven days? What about science? What about this and that and the other? But the real issue isn't how God created it. The real issue is why. And creation is here because love itself requires someone to love in order for it to be complete in that sense. And so it's, it, we are here because God wants to love us. That's why we're here. It's an explanation of free will. Love is not, is not love, I don't think, unless there's free will. It's an explanation of redemption. If God was only law and justice, He'd have left us to the consequences of our sin and our disobedience. But because He is love, He has to seek and save the lost. Because that's who He is. So that's a little bit of the classroom. But what about the living room? How do we live out real love? If God loves us and we're meant to, li to love others like God loves us, how many of you know that's really tough, isn't it? It's really hard in our marriages. It's really hard in our families, in our friendships, in our communities, in our workplaces. And at times, it's even hard in our church to love others. How do we love like God loves us? Before we look at that, take a look at the screen. Love. 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 Love in this world is pretty messed up. It asks for a lot and it never returns the favor. Love in my world? Well, it brings more trouble than it's worth. In my world, love has felt like... Sabotage. It flees into the night. It, it, it leaves at the first sign of trouble. And it never feels like I love you no matter what. Because love in my world, it leaves. And when it leaves, there's only disaster left. Oh, it promises a lot, but it doesn't deliver much. It breaks hearts. I've picked up the pieces of my broken heart one too many times. So I build walls. Love isn't worth the tears. The pain, the loneliness. The surrender. It's exhausting. Even when you try to do love right, love fails. I have made a mess out of love. What good is it? You can't help me. Why love at all? Why do I even try to love? Why sacrifice to carry the burden? Why? 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 Because there is a perfect love. Perfect love that can end the disaster. A perfect love that can heal the brokenhearted. There is a love that saved those who are dwelling in this messed up world. God tells us about it because we wouldn't recognize it if it showed up on our own doorstep. It's a love that takes its time. It's profound. It doesn't brag or bad mouth. God's love is like a shield that we know will never leave us. And that you can trust. Hoping. And you never, ever exhaust it. That's his kind of love. And it never fails. And while we were keeping records of wrongs and self-seeking and being unkind, he still died for us. How can I love like that? How can I love like that? How can I love like that? 
because I am loved like that. I can love well, not because of me, but because he first loved me. Great truths in that. I'm aware that in this room and watching and listening, there will be lots of us and this subject is going to get difficult. It's going to touch into some areas of pain and wounds in our life. I'm going to do it anyway because this is true. And my hope and prayer is that as I go through this in the next 15 minutes or so, that God by His Holy Spirit brings us all a new sense of His love and that we then get to know how to pass that on to others. How do we live out real love? I want to use the framework of the talk that I did at Matt and Reb's wedding because contrary to popular opinion, I can write a new wedding talk from time to time, which I did on that occasion. And I want to use this framework because I think, I think it's got a lot to say. Number one, real love has to grow up. Real love has to grow up. You know, we dedicated uh, Evie this morning, and if you've had babies, you'll know that when you have a baby, uh, what a baby does is that when a baby is hungry, the baby cries and someone feeds them. When a baby is lonely, they cry and someone picks them up. When a baby wants to go to the toilet, they go ahead. Somebody else gets to sort it out. How many of you know that's a baby? You're not meant to stay like that. Yeah? And yet many of us in our love, we stay in baby love rather than growing up to adult love and to mature love. You see, the love we see in our culture now is temporal, conditional, and fickle. It doesn't last it's conditioned on what's in it for me, and it's so easily broken. And unfortunately, we see that love in our relationships and in the church as well. And that's not adult love, that's baby love. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, When I was a child, I taught like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, which was appropriate because I was a child, that's my word. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. And you see, real love is love that grows up. It grows up. And grown-up love is not self-oriented. Grown-up love is not all about me. <laughs> a, a, a single guy put into a computer, you know, one of these kind of match kind of things to try and find the ideal partner. And he put this in. I want a companion who is small and attractive, loves water sports, and enjoys group activities. Computer said, marry a penguin. You see, love that's baby love is all about me. Love that is adult love is all about you. It's putting others first. It's not self-oriented. Mature love is not selfish or self-serving. A, a, a mature love isn't all about, well, I don't feel like it. You see, grown-up love is not emotionally driven. Grown-up love is not emotionally driven. That's baby love. Grown-up love is not emotionally driven. Scott Peck, who's an author, said, Love is a choice, an act of the will, a decision involving intention and action. That may or may not be accompanied by feelings. And I say this, I think I've probably read that at every wedding I've ever done. Because I would say, listen, the feelings you've got today won't last, okay? But real love can grow stronger and stronger the longer you go on. That's true in families and in churches and in friendships and in marriages. Real love is not emotionally driven. You know, grown-up love is not easily broken. I think I've told you this story before, but a couple of years ago, Alison and myself went out on one New Year's Eve with some friends of ours from the church. And, and we didn't want to go to a party, so we went to a, a theatre <laughs> so, and I thought this would be a great night out on New Year's Eve. Uh, and uh, so I arranged it. And it was a modern retelling of the Romeo and Juliet story. Um, and I thought this would be fun. Oh, dear. Um, and, and basically, the couple were in their 80s. They were playing a couple in their 80s, the characters. I mean, it was an amazing uh, thing. And they basically were, she was dying, and had dementia, and all the kind of stuff. Great night out. I'm a good party in person, me. And, and this was all going on. And, uh, but basically, they lived, they, they, they then... They then had flashbacks of, of when they first met and when they were teenagers and when they married and when they danced together and when they had kids. And it told their whole story. And the two actors, there were only two actors in it, told the whole story of their love. But actually, as you saw them as 80-year-olds, when she was about to pass away, they loved each other with the intensity that they had when they were kids. I thought, that's powerful. You don't see that in our culture. The only people you see having sex are people who aren't married. Have you noticed that? Let me tell you, married sex is the best. I didn't say that at the first service, and my wife was here, but I didn't say that at the second. <laughs> but the thing is, you see, we only ever see, we only ever see sex and intimacy like that when it's, I've picked somebody up at the bar, or when someone at work, or someone, that's all that we ever see. So our culture is baby love. It's not adult love. It's not mature love. 
And here's the thing. When I watched this Romeo and Juliet thing, I thought, oh, that, isn't that incredible? That love grown like that. Here's the sad thing. The growth in people separating who have been together for decades is growing. They call it silver separation. It's risen by 58% in the last 10 years. We're being impacted by our culture more than we realize. Guys, grown-up love grows stronger over time if you're married. Grown-up love isn't all about me and my feelings. Grown-up love is something much deeper and more courageous and more bold than that. Grown-up love can handle tension. You know, we can love each other in relationship and handle tension. The reason many people leave church is that their love is baby love. They can't work out an issue in properly. They just have to clear off because they're babies. But grown-up love handles tension and deals with conflict in a good way. And we can learn to, uh, to, to, to work out differences. We can learn to walk each other and have different opinions. We can even learn to forgive each other because we've been forgiven by this incredible love. Corrie Ten Boom, great and amazing woman. Uh, she said this, forgiveness is the key that unlocks the door of resentment and the handcuffs of hatred. It is a power that breaks the chains of bitterness and the shackles of selfishness. It's the kind of love we need, isn't it? It's a grown-up love. So my challenge to you is this, is this morning, if you're here, if you're watching, if you're listening, my challenge, is there someone in your world that you need to show grown-up love to? Maybe it's time to put away baby love and begin to man up or woman up and show some grown-up love to that person. Secondly, real love has to show up. You know, the Bible says in the book of James, faith without deeds is dead. In other words, faith without deeds is worthless. But I think love without expression is useless. You know, I, I've been to many, many funerals. You know that is my job. I've been to many this side of the pulpit and many that side of the pulpit as well. And at every single funeral, a thought always flashes through my mind. As they're talking about the person who's died, the thought that passes through my mind is this, did that person know it? Did that person ever hear these words that we speak about them at their funeral? Because wouldn't it be tragic if they didn't know it? We say all these got good things, don't we, about people when they die. But do we ever express those things to each other when we're alive? You see, for love to be real love, it has to show up. It has to be evidenced. It has to be articulated. And I want to do something which is really not very British this morning. I want to take you into some un-British waters. I'm going to talk about speaking to each other about how much we appreciate one another. Whether it's in a marriage, in a family, friendship, or in church, or in any other environment, could we show up the love that we feel? Because we can feel it, but if we don't say it or express it, I want to suggest it's useless. Useless. But here's the thing that happens. Whenever we think about this, we th there's like an editing process that goes on in our mind. And it says, well, if I say it or express it or show it, then maybe they'll think, what, you weirdo? Or maybe there'll th it'll just be an awkward, embarrassing silence. Or maybe they'll pick up their stuff and leave. Do you know what I mean? And so we have this editing process of what happens. But love, I think we live in a love-starved society. And it's not that we don't feel love towards other people, but we don't show it. We don't show up. And I want to give you three really practical ways that, you can, that your love can show up to each other. And then I'm going to give you some challenges to do this week, okay? So number one, you can say it. You can say it. You can say to someone who's not dead, but actually alive and can hear what you say, I love this about you. I really appreciate this about you. When you do that, that really encourages me. The way you do that is incredible. So what I want to do this morning is we're going to practice. So what I want you to do is to turn to the person next to you and just say this. This is all you've got to say. I know some of you are squirming as I speak. Just say, I appreciate this about you. Don't even say what it is. Just say the words so that you can hear you saying the words, I appreciate this about you. Just that sentence, go. <laughs> oh, awkwardness. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Now, let me ask you a question. Who died? Did anyone die? Put your hand up if you died then. No, hopefully nobody did. See, nobody dies. But wouldn't it be incredible if we lived our lives like that, that actually we stopped someone and we said, I want to say something to you. Well, that would be amazing. Wouldn't that be an incredible culture to be in, in? I think that would be incredible. So we can say it. Secondly, we can write it. 
Maybe for some of us it's awkward to say, but you can write it. Actually, sometimes writing it can be even more powerful than saying it. Because when you take the time to send a text or a message or an email, or better still, get out one of those things, you may have heard of it, called a pen. Anyone heard of a pen? In fact, I've forgotten how to write with a pen, to be honest these days. But when you write a card and you send it to someone, not only do you articulate something good that you want to say to them, but they know that you've taken time. And time is so incredibly important, isn't it? We communicate our love more through our time than through anything else these days. But also, they can keep it and read it and reflect on it. I want to let you into a secret. In my office, in my desk, I have a folder. In my folder are cards and messages that people have written me over the years. When you send me a nice message, and many of you do, and I appreciate it, I put them in that folder. On certain days, on certain bad days, which I do have from time to time, I get that folder out and I read over those cards and I read those messages because it reminds me that I'm not on my own, I'm not crazy, and there are good people out there who appreciate what I'm doing and that actually encourages me and that is like God speaking into my life. And you could be like that for someone else. You could be someone that passes on love to someone else. And connected to that, not only can you say it, not only could you write it, but you could express it with acts of kindness. You know... Many of you know, because we, we, we put it out, we don't often say about it, but we put it out this week on social media that this has been a difficult week for us as a family. Um, we've had the vision gatherings, which have been great, but at the same time, Simeon has had two medical interventions over the last couple of weeks, and this week had to go in for surgery. Our youngest son, Simeon, has complex special needs and disabilities. What he actually had was very minor, but, but, but because of his dis- disability and difficulties, could have been very major. He had to have general anesthetics. It's been a very hard week. He's come through it really well, and we had a brilliant day with him yesterday. And um, we, we were going to go out to some friends last night. We just couldn't do that, so we had to give our apologies for that because we wanted to spend longer with Simeon in the day. And when we kind of flopped at about 8 o'clock at night or whatever it was, um, we, we flopped into the lounge, and we were just reflecting and, and thanking God for what he'd done. And it had been a very long, tiring week. And there was a ring at our doorbell. And um, we went out and opened the porch, and, and somebody had driven off. We don't know who it was. We still don't know who it was. But in our porch was a bag of stuff. There was some flowers and some chocolates and some drink <laughs> and some food. And a card that just said some really great things. And I don't know who it is. So if it is one of you, thank you so much, because God used you to speak into our lives last night. And uh, the reason I say that is that I know the impact of that in my own life. Expressed, written, articulated love is incredibly powerful. Wouldn't it be amazing if we were all like that? And as I've received that this weekend, I want to be someone this week that gives it to somebody else. Because maybe then I could be that voice of God into someone's life. Like whoever it was that gave us that stuff last night, you were the voice of God into our lives and we really want to thank you for that. So is there someone in your life that you need to let your love show up? So this week, even today, even before we leave, could you say it? Or could you write it? Send a text, send an email, use a pen. Or could you express it with an act act of kindness? What an amazing world we'd live in, wouldn't it? If we lived like that. That the love that we'd receive from God, we loved like God and we said it. Jesus said it often. God often in the Bible expresses, you are precious in my sight. You are honored. You're the apple of my eye. He says it and expresses it so many times. We need to love like he loves us. Number three, real love, (laughs) this is for me, sometimes has to shut up. Sometimes has to shut up. Soon after our last child left home for college, my husband was resting next to me on the couch with his head in my lap. I carefully removed his glasses. You know, honey, I said sweetly, without your glasses, you look like the same handsome young man I married all those years ago. Honey, he replied with a grin, without my glasses, you still look pretty good too. (laughs) The The Bible says, be quick to listen, slow to speak. Sometimes real love has to shut up. I'm terrible at this. Terrible. Because when Alice and my wife is trying to express feelings and emotions and stuff, I'm already giving her the solution. Anyone else understand that that's going on? Uh, But real love sometimes shuts up. Because when you shut up 
and hold the space. You communicate love. You communicate empathy. You communicate that this isn't just about me giving you a solution. This is about me hearing what's going on for you. And when I do that, I know that that is communicating love in a way that Alison appreciates. And sometimes in all of our relationships, sometimes real love just has to shut up. Stephen Covey, who's a leadership writer, he says, The biggest communication problem is we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. There's so much depth in that, isn't there? One of the biggest communication problem in our culture is we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. And so we tweet before we've even heard what someone said. And we tweet something out and we're off and we're off and we reply and we reply rather than just listening, holding the space, being present. Sometimes real love shuts up. And, f- and so challenge, is there someone in your life that you need to shut up for and just be there and be present and be in their life? Maybe just remembering something. Maybe just holding a space where you can be present in their life. Wouldn't that be amazing in our workplaces? You know, if instead of just speaking to each other, we listen to each other. In our friendships, in our small groups, in our communities, with our neighbours. You know, that we just listen to one another and just actually held a space where we were fully present, not on our phone, not giving them the answer, but just shutting up and being present. I think that would change the world. Number four, ultimately real love has to look up. Real love has to grow up. Real love must show up. At times it has to shut up. But ultimately, for us, real love has to look up. Because you and I, our love tank can run empty. His never does. Incredible verse in John chapter 15 from the message. Jesus says, I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy and your joy wholly mature. In other words, grown up. This is my command. Love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. So listen, when, you, you, when your love is empty, when your love tank is running dry, look up. Remind yourselves of who Jesus is, who God is, how he has loved you. And that as we receive his love, then we've got a love to give to others. We can never love like God if we're not being loved by God. One of my favorite quotes, Wayne Jacobson, he said this, We will never love effectively if we're not loved extravagantly. You'll never, be loved like, you'll never love like God if you're not being loved by God. So the challenge is this, love needs to move from our head to our heart and at times even to our mouth and to our hands that we can express it. But if, if this kind of love is connected to being loved by God, why do we have such a problem in being loved by God? Because if we only were loved by God, then maybe we could love like God. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. This is the Father's love song over us, guys. It says He delights in us. You know, I, I grew up in a Christian family. I love my Christian family, still do, and the environment I grew up in. But, but the environment church-wise that I grew up in did have a little tendency to stress duty over relationship. And so I grew up thinking God loves me because he has to, because it's in his job description. And when I came to the realization and the revelation that God doesn't love me because he has to, but he loves me because he wants to, it changed everything. Paul says that we are loved according to his will and good pleasure. I love that. According to his will and good pleasure. He delights in us. He quiets us with his love. God doesn't want you and I running around looking for love in all the wrong places. He wants to quieten us down so that we can be loved by him. And then he rejoices over us with singing. You know, parents and, and their children will often serenade their kids to try and get them to sleep, won't they? And then they'll give them cowpoll and drive them around and run to all other kinds of things. But we often try and sing a love song. We serenade. And this is what the scripture says, God is singing a serenade, a love song over us, but we can't hear it because of all the discords in our life, because of all of the broken relationships, because of all of the unhealthy experiences of love that we've had. And all of a sudden, God is trying to sing this love song, but all we can hear is discords and discords, and we can't hear the serenade of the Father. I want to give you just five quick words before we finish that will help you, and they'll help me. What do we do with this? Number one, we have to trust. We have to trust that God loves us even when we don't feel it. Even when we can't hear the music, we have to trust. It's true because God says it's true. Secondly, we have to obey. 
You know, the book of Jude is a very small book in the New Testament. And Jude says, keep yourself in God's love. You see, people often come to me and say, I don't feel like God loves me. And when you dig deep, sometimes it's because there's things in their life that ain't right. And when there's things in our life that ain't right, you ain't going to feel God's love. It's not because God's not singing the song. It's because you put a block in it and we need to do something. We need to obey. We need to reposition. A couple of weeks ago, Sam used our children's pastor, his wife, Hannah, who works for Faith, part of the church. She, she gave me a word which was really important. Uh, and she said that, uh, that she was sitting in the back uh, at one of the services recently and she sat behind the pillar and she couldn't quite see things. But she moved one seat and the whole picture changed. Sometimes we have to reposition ourselves in order for the picture to change. Sometimes we have to reposition ourselves in order for us to hear properly. We have to obey. We have to keep ourselves in God's love. Thirdly, we need to pray. We need to ask God. David said, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And then I think we need to worship. We need to stand in the way of God. Sometimes we think that we sing to a, uh, you know, from a place of joy, but sometimes we sing to a place of joy. We sing out of obedience and we worship out of obedience. And then we wait. So we trust, we obey, we pray, we worship, and then we wait. Sometimes this is the hardest thing to do. But if you wait, I promise you, God's love will hit you. It will hit you. And it will fill you. Lamentations 3 from the message <laughs> says this, I'll never forget the trouble, the utter lostness, the taste of ashes, the poison I've swallowed. I remember it all. I remember the feeling of hitting the bottom. But there's one thing I remember, and remembering I keep a grip on hope. Listen to this. God's loyal love couldn't have run out. His merciful love couldn't have dried up. They're created new every morning. How great is your faithfulness. I'm sticking with God. He's all I've got left. I love that verse from the message. <laughs> How great is your faithfulness. I'm sticking with God. He's all I've got left. I want to ask the band if they'll come back up. What we're going to do this morning is I want to read something to you and over you this morning. These are not my words. The words that I've found somewhere else. But I want to ask you and invite you, if you wouldn't mind, just closing your eyes just for a moment. Is that okay? And, and if you could, just in the last few minutes, and maybe if you're listening or watching this morning as well, or wherever you're watching it or listening, maybe you do the same wherever you are. Just close your eyes for a moment. Try and shut out all the other distractions. And I want to read some words. And I want you not to hear my voice. I know you will. But through it all, listen to God's voice. This is truth for you. And I know this is really difficult for many of us to hear because of all the stuff that's gone on in our lives and all of our experiences with love. But this love that I'm talking about is love of another kind. This is real love. This is the love that God has for you. God loves you simply because He has chosen to do so. God loves you when you don't feel lovely. God loves you when no one else loves you. Others may abandon you, divorce you, ignore you, but God will love you always, no matter what. God loves you personally, powerfully, and passionately. Others have promised and failed, but God has promised and succeeded. He loves you with an unfailing love. And His love, if you let it, can fill you and leave you with a love worth sharing with others. Now, while our eyes are still closed, I wonder if there's anyone here, and maybe you're, in, I need love like that. I need love like that. Maybe you've never asked God for love like that. Maybe you've never given your life to God. You don't know what that, this love is like, or you've never experienced it. Or maybe you have, but it's been a long time since you've known this love in your life. If that's you this morning, our eyes are still closed. Why don't you just stick your hand up as a way of saying, that's me. I'm responding, God, to you. I'm doing something. I'm repositioning myself. I'm just saying, God, that's me. Thank you. Is there anyone else this morning? I want to just pray for you guys this morning. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Father, I thank you for these hands going up. Lord Jesus, I thank you. For the response, Lord, in our hearts. Many of our hands haven't gone up, but our heart has grown out. God, we need you and we want you. We don't want to be running around for all of the kind of shallow, baby, cheap love. God, we want the real thing. We want love of another kind. So, Father, would you come 
And would you fill these guys and girls with your presence and your spirit. They may not feel it now, but Lord, may they receive it in faith, I pray. May they stand in the way of you and may they, God, begin to even love like you've loved them. And God, as we love, maybe you'd fill us up again so we'd have love worth sharing. Father, now as we sing about your incredible love, Lord, I pray that even as we sing, God, may you fill us again with this love. And may we not keep it here, but may we take it out there where it matters. It matters here, but it really matters out there. May we take it into our marriages and our families and our churches and our workplaces and our schools and our colleges and our streets and our neighborhoods. And may we be people that love as you have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't we stand? Stand.